Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of the UK Connection, along with my UK cohorts, as always, Mr. Simon Bray and Mr. Stephen Reed. I got it right. I got. I almost. I almost deviated. I almost. It's hard. <laughs> Just you guys, just so you know, we had we had this whole conversation before we started taping about exactly where we are in the Zoom and how it appears on camera. So we're not looking and pointing in the wrong directions. It's not as easy as you might think. Right. <laughs> you know, back in the old days when I was went to broadcasting school, they told, you, you know, a lot of times you're in front of like a green screen or a blue screen. And what like especially on the news and what you see behind them, the newscasters, there's nothing there. It's a blank screen. They're looking off screen at another screen and they learn to kind of point to all the right places. So it's it's this little, it's very hard to do. So this is no different, I think. <laughs> right, Stephen? There we go. Yes, indeed. Right, Simon? Yes, indeed. So uh, we've got a fun show for you here today. We're kind of going to do a little twist on our normal AOR melodic rock show. Similar format, different genre, sort of, right? So instead of uh, that type of music, Today we're going to take a look at the new wave of British heavy metal. We're going to talk about a down and out classic, one that's a little bit more of an underground pick, and one it's like, oh, that band, yeah, they were a new wave of British heavy metal band? Yeah, exactly. But three very good albums that we're going to talk about today. We'll get to them in a minute, but beforehand we have a little bit of business to take care of, and I will defer over to Simon to get us started with the beer selections of the day. As I'll crack my door. Okay, okay. I don't know if I've mentioned, but I went on holiday last week. Have I mentioned that? I saw, yeah, did I I no. saw the no. pictures from Simon on his holiday. He looked like he was having a did, grand old time. Did did I put any beer pictures in the chat? I feel like I did. Yeah. I think I think you did, Simon. Yes, usually put I was at work. Yes, thanks. Cheers. Sorry. <laughs> Anyhow, obviously I've brought brought some back. Um mainly because I could uh, mini bar just didn't empty quick enough, but I've I've got my super cool Montenegro um, beer up beer um, um, opener thing bottle opener. There we go. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's acoustic. They didn't do flying V, and um, but I've got a Serbian lager. Now we all know I don't like lager, but fuck it, let's go for it. It's called, it's called Yellen, I believe. That's probably how it's pronounced. It is Serbian, so yeah. Okay. We're gonna try it. We're gonna try it uh, any second now. We're gonna pour it off camera. <laughs> get back. I mean, can you really fuck up pouring a lager? Can you? You oh, really can. Of can. You? I, I'm yeah, sure well, I can. Obviously, obviously, Pete can. I yes, I've done it. You can fuck up pouring anything, can't you? But uh, yeah, look at that. It's beautiful. Look at that. It's, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, that's that's. Let's predict that I'm going to call it no more than 1.75 out of 5. Here we go. But that's exactly what I'm going to give it, because it's a lot. I could, I could drink one in a bit before before suddenly go, oh, I'm the gassiest person in the world. <laughs> I love it. how he gets blurry as he says that. That was, that, that, that uh, was unplanned and classic. <laughs> I, I I went I went to uh, university as well and did did media so it's all good yeah there you go awesome yeah so oh, yes wow. it's a it's a it's a it's an okay okay kind of lager it would be um, another entire... round of lager lager there we go see what you did there you made a Marillion reference didn't you? and and I understood it see that <laughs> I, I am you, well, you made us listen to that album actually. I am the king of Prague. Yes, yeah, I am. I am the prof Prague. Yes. So, um, yeah, it's a, it would be absolutely great on a hot summer day when I was the wolf with the red rose. Yes, indeed. Do you see what I did there, kids? Straight back at you. Ah, a little loaf. <laughs> yep. I'm done. Well, as the Luddite here, because I did not go to university, I did not study media, all of these things are show quite easily. Uh, I have got a 10-story malt bomb. Okay. Describing itself as an, a modern 80 shilling. Don't know what that means, but there's some amount of shite on the back of here. Okay. Um, we are part of a revolution, but we are not revolutionaries. We are alchemists. We search for inspirational elements, ideas, and flavors before mixing them together 
in our own unique way to create the best beers you'll ever taste. Sure. We come from Livingston. That's not a good start. Okay. Oh. Um, it does look like this in the glass, though. So oh. that's okay. It's good. Mm, I don't know if it's one of the best beers I'll ever taste. It's not bad, though. It's about a 3.8964, I think. That's oh, really good. Yeah, yeah, like that. Mm. It's very malty, I have to say. It does it does what it says on the bottle, basically. And that's what yeah, it's quite bitter as well. Yeah, that's got really quite good, actually. Like that. That. Malt bomb, that's got to be malt up front, right? It's malt up front, to be fair, yes. Absolutely. Like Didn't need all the nonsense on the back. There you go. Yeah, it's, I got a no nonsense can here as well. So this is, I, I'm drinking a beer from the home of Steve Keeler, Middletown, New York. It's uh, from the Aspire Brewing Company, which is a brewery that just came, popped up like about a year ago, created by the guys who own this um, kind of beverage center franchise called Beer World. It's like a beer store. They have them all over the place. They put all their money together and they decide to make a brewery and restaurant, fun place, very cool place. Anyway, the uh, the beer is called Weidmann German Style Pilsner. Their cans are very boring they all kind of look the same although all of them maybe have the the lettering is a little different they're all in these like black cans that are just kind of boring uh and i, I quite little, like that huh? i quite like that i quite it, like that it's majestic it's just, it's different than a lot of the other american brewers who are doing all these wacky things with the cans and all these like drawings and paint and you know they're all this is kind of plain but it's kind of majestic and like you know this is this is beer right you do not gonna yeah so German style Pilsner, 5.3%, 16 fluid ounces. Uh, and it looks kind of like this. I've lost some of the head is kind of dissipated here, but it's in my Zeus Brewing Company glass. And uh, nice, you know, it's a little, it's slightly hazy for a Pilsner, but not really. Um, it's really solid. It's just a good tasting German style Pilsner. Great for the spring and summer months and uh, 3.75. Really good. I could drink this any day of the week. Just really good. Clean, enough character to it. Yeah, it's good. That's good. Good stuff. Cheers, gentlemen. All right, Stephen, you want to, or uh, one of you, would you like to introduce the three albums that we're talking about today? <clears throat> I will indeed. We are going for so a classic Nawabaham album. We have got Lightning to the Nations by Diamond Head. Okay. For the underground classic, underground, yeah, I suppose it is. We have got Shock Tactics by Samson. Okay. And then the one that falls into, well, I don't quite know what we're calling this. Is it an, are they a new wave of British heavy metal band at all? Possibly, but they certainly came out around this time. So this is. The debut album from Demon. This is Night of the Demon. Probably as famous for its cover as it is for anything else. Yep. Um, and that is our full selection. So that's the three that we're going to be covering. So I don't know if you want a bit of background on... We'll start with Diamond Head, will we? So Lightning to the Nations. This is the debut album by Diamond Head. Released in 1980. Uh, they weren't on a label at the time, so it was released in, as Pete showed earlier, a plain white sleeve, just with a kind of band of signatures. There you go on the front, and it was known more as the White Album rather than Lightning to the Nations. At that point, the idea was to record it and then shop it around and try and get a deal. In the end, the band printed up uh, a thousand pressings, sold them all themselves at gigs and mail order, as you did back then. Uh, and so successful was it that they printed up uh, a second load of the same amount, sold them out as well. And eventually, it ended up uh, on a German label called Wolf records um in 1981 it got a german only release there um and after they did that the german label promptly lost the master tapes which was very helpful for everybody concerned and from there the album has had a variety of different kind of versions lightning to the nations was what it was called when it came out in germany it's been reissued as the white album as lightning to the nations i've got a two cd version here 
that was put out through Cherry Red just three years ago. Yep. It was also put out in a two CD version by Silver Lining Music two years ago. The band themselves re recorded this album in 2020. Let's not talk too much about that version, to be fair, we didn't need that. Some versions supposedly come from the vinyl where the master tapes were used, some come from other, it's, it's all over the place. I mean, it's been released on more labels and in more ways than you can shake a stick at, okay? The band was Brian Tatler on guitar, who is now, of course, also of Saxon and still of Diamond Head, if Diamond Head are still running alongside. Sean Harris on vocals, Colin Kimberley on bass, Duncan Scott on drums. It was produced by the band with a guy called Reg Fellows, who was part of the management team at the time. And yeah, obviously because of the way that it was released, this is not charted anywhere, but there's no doubt that it has become a cult classic. It's become very much an underground cult classic and seen as one of the kind of standard bearers for the new wave of British heavy metal. In all honesty, it's possibly best known for having four of its seven songs covered either on stage or on record by Metallica on a very, very regular basis. And they have spoken about this band as an influence right from the off. Um, and that is the White Album, or as I've got, Lightning to the Nations by Diamond Head. Awesome. What do you think, Simon? Well, as you know, I try not to think because I'm not allowed. But, uh, you know, you know. Um, this was not my idea, was it? This wasn't my idea. Well, excuse me interrupting you, Simon. I was actually going to ask, because I've got these three albums. I know that Pete does. This is not necessarily your wheelhouse in the way that we did Southern Rock last week. That wasn't necessarily Pete. my wheelhouse. No. How, did you um, know these three albums before we started? I'm aware. I own one of them. I'm not going to not going to show it yet because it's not this one. Um, I own one of them. Um, I own a few uh, Samson, not this one. Um, and everything I've got by Diamond Head, I taped taped off Friday Rock Show about forty years ago, and he's on cassette. <laughs> and still works. You know, home taping really did kill music. <laughs> 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 yeah but the thing is though and I, I do like this record I really do like, like it it's not like me to not buy a physical version of something that I actually like so I have other than the fact that you know when I came out I was a bit of when it came out I was a bit of a whippersnapper and I'd only really just started buying it um, I've no idea why I didn't uh, why I don't own a copy? I, I genuinely don't. I genuinely don't. Um, um, I'm not convinced by no album um, as an actual genre either. You know, so for instance, um, when we did Southern Rock, I like so I like Southern Rock. I I went out and at some point I bought all the Molly Hatch albums. I bought all the Thirty Eight Special albums. I got all the Allman Allman albums. I got all the all the Outlaw albums. I, I thought that's a cohesive genre. I like that. I'm going to like everything in it. Um, I'm not entirely sure that I, that's a route that you can go down with the new wave of British heavy metal. Um, we'll talk about that today. No, yeah, doubt. yeah. So, you know, is there, a, a, is there really a link between some of the bands that kind of get lumped in there? You know, sometimes sometimes you see Motorhead, it, you know, um, as a new album band, they don't sound like um, a Diamond Head, do they? Yeah. So. Maybe we'll discuss that at the end. But anyway, as a, as an album, um, it's an excellent album. Isn't it, isn't it a good album? It really is. I don't know why I've never bought it. I will. I will if I see it in the world. Rectify that situation. You know, there there are a number of classics on the. I do not. But I I think you're right, Stephen. I bet there's a whole bunch of people out there who cannot sing "Am I Evil," for instance, not in the voice of James Hetfield. Yes, "Am I Evil?" Or, ah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yes. You know um, <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. I think Metallica do covers really well, yeah. um, but it's not as good as the original version. Um, none of none of the covers are quite as good as the original version, but I, I'm sure it's given them a nice little pension or something like that. And you you listen to them, and you can see a line a line between say um, Priest and Purple and Sabbath within the, within the music, and you think, right, you know, 
there's something about this band. You think that even if this, you know, because um, of record company shenanigans, they might go on and, and become really popular, you know, or at least ach achieve a level of longevity and, um, want a better word, fame like, say, Saxon have, you know, just not top tier Iron Maiden style kind of thing. But, you know, but they kind of never had and the song the songs are there you know singer's great the rhythm section's solid as a solid thing that's really quite solid uh, like my table um you know how great is help is helpless as a song simple yet complex you know it's just really good the, and do you know what it's a pretty concise record as well isn't it kids there you know, I, 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 you know, you know, your uncle Simon likes that. So he really, he really does. It's a, it's a really, really good, really good record. And I'm actually here to stand up for the re-recording as well, which I did download. Um, that is just the loudest record of all time. <laughs> it's just, just what the, what the, oh, 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 whatever subtle, whatever subtlety was there um, previously just went straight out the window with that modern sound in it. Mm, I was driving the car the other day. Boy, yay. I'm a hyper yeah, you really are quite evil. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it's um, a, re a really good record. And you can see why um, people said this is a classic because you know, much of it actually uh, really well. Oh, it stands up, doesn't it? Forty odd years later, it stands up. So yeah, but I don't own it, and I feel like a terrible human being. So had yeah. you heard it before doing this? No, I'd never heard it from front to back. I'd heard most of most of the songs le completely legally, honest. Uh, yes, and um, mo mostly in live versions, to be honest. Fair enough. Because you know they did the odd session, and they were were they at Reading somewhere, something like that. I recall. I mean, imagine some... Yeah, there were a lot of those. Yeah, they. You know, I do. I recall here, here in live uh, crowd noises in between the songs on my still working cassettes forty years later. Simon, I would recommend after you kind of maybe hopefully go and purchase this, check out their last couple of albums that they've released mm -hmm. more recently. Really good. It doesn't sound all that similar to this, but it's still really, really good. Yeah, I would agree with that, actually. Yeah, th this is a it's a strange release, this. It's, it's a, a genre classic. Of that, there's no doubt. Um, I've reviewed this on the webzine. I reviewed this version that's got B sides and twelve inch versions and various things on a second disc, which is almost as good as what's on the album. I think its mythical kind of status comes from one how difficult it was to get back in the day. They became that kind of, you know, aren't they fantastic? Have you heard it? Sort of band. Um, and then also, I think a lot of people probably came in the way that I did, which was through Metallica. It was from hearing songs like Am I Evil, The Prince, and Helpless in a variety of different ways, whether it be bootlegs or the Garage Days, we revisited EP or whatever it was, and all, all these various things. That by the time that I actually came around to hearing this album, I kind of went, oh man, this is polite, isn't it? And that's sort of the way that it was, because Metallica are not a polite band. And this is not a polite album, but production wise, is an album that's produced on a budget by people who possibly weren't the right people to be doing it and all of those various things. And yet, what Metallica do to these songs is just beef them up. They don't muck about with them. They don't rearrange them. They don't kind of reinvent the wheel. They just go, to you know what, let's just play them the way that we sound because these songs are already here. They don't have to fan about them. Yeah, there's a, a couple of points where they maybe change the tempo and certain sections on certain songs and various things like that. And probably, to be fair, do it a little bit better in, in that sense. But, wow, I mean, things like It's Electric, what a great song. What a great vocal. And it's easy to hear why bands who were searching for something saw this as an influence. Do you know why they went and thought, this, this is where we want to go, but can we just kind of add a little bit more to it. I mean, the guitar work across this album is absolutely tremendous. It's really, really good. 
you could argue that considering where we are in the stage of new wave of British heavy metal, it's ahead of its time. Do you know that just the whole kind of guitar attack it isn't kind of harking back to the seventies? Yes, you can hear the links. This is not something that's never, never, ever been done before, but not necessarily like this. And then when you add in a really good singer, which is what you've got here, yeah, you've got a perfect combination really. And the rhythm section are great too. They don't get the credit because they weren't with the band for very long and various things like that. But the whole unit here really works in a way that it doesn't on the albums that follow before they split and come back again umpteen different times. You then have things like <clears throat> Sucking My Love, um, <laughs> which is um, not just one of the worst song titles ever. It's definitely one of the worst lyrics because it really goes, there's not many words in that song. And we are, we're not doing double entendres. This is, this is straight ahead. Uh, what you see is what you get kind of stuff but it's a great song <laughs> you know Sweet and Innocent is really good fun the title track is cool it's a really good introduction to the album and what this album lacks in dynamics through its production and through its sound it makes up for them the songwriting and the performances and I would say that just the overall energy that it possesses and you can understand why bands who were lucky enough or people who were lucky enough to hear this back then were looking at it again and going, wow, this, this, this is hot, this is serious. This, this is real stuff. And I'd love to have heard the band live at that stage. And as Pete mentioned earlier, the recent stuff's really good. And I saw them, ironically enough, open for Saxon a couple of years ago and they were just fantastic in their, in their current guys. Very little to do with this, although they played songs from this album, of course. But yeah, th this is a is a genre classic. I gave it 4.5 out of 5 on the web scene when I re reviewed this version. And you could argue it deserves the full five because of its importance to the genre. There are a few albums that have probably brought the band as little genuine chart success or renown in terms of sales that have had such a big impact across music for such a length of time afterwards. So yeah, it's, it's something pretty special. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, I think this is a pretty terrific album, a pretty terrific band back then and now. And, uh, you know, it's really interesting. You, you mentioned Saxon and we talked about Southern Rock before. So you got this guy, Brian Tatler, who a founding member and lead guitarist of the band who, you know, played some pretty intense stuff on this album. And how cool and interesting is it that all these years later, he not, he now finds himself in Saxon as co-lead guitar player. Which reminds me of like, you know, Ricky Medlock or Huey Thomason from Blackfoot and the Outlaws joining Leonard Skinner much later in their career, right? It's a very similar type thing here where, you know, you have these peers who are friends and respect each other. And then when when the need arises, they call on someone from a peer band and they fit right in as if they were always in the band, right? So it's kind of interesting. Um, yeah, this is, uh, you know, production aside, I mean, this is rough and raw, and I haven't heard the re-recording of this from the current band. Uh, I'm almost kind of intrigued, but I almost like don't want to hear it, but, you know, because it's, it's always, yeah, it's always weird when they do that, right? Totally different lineup, different singer, you know, all that kind of stuff. But um, what's really interesting is you got this guy, Sean Harris, who's a terrific singer, but not your stereotypical stereotypical metal singer. I mean, he's got this kind of bluesy thing going on, but it really works. Um, you got these longish songs. There's lots of guitar solos and jamming. I mean, the title track is great. Sucking My Love is a crazy song. I mean, there's just some scorching guitar work on that. Uh, you know, Am I Evil is classic. I absolutely, my favorite song is probably Helpless. And I always kind of do the, the James Hetfield wail when, when that, because uh, I think they do help us really good, but the, the, the song itself is so good. Uh, it's electric, it's weird, it's kind of punky, kind of glammy, excellent stuff. Um, everything on here is great. And, you know, if you get any of the editions of this, like the new one that Steven showed, or even the early one, you get like all the like B-sides and singles, because that was the big thing, yeah. Um, with these new wave of British heavy metal bands, they release singles and EPs constantly. So here you got, you know, Shoot Out the Lights and Streets of Gold and Diamond Lights and, you know, so on and so forth. All excellent, all worth hearing. It's raw. It's just filled with great songs. 
So I can't recommend this highly enough. And it's a classic for a reason. It's just sadly that this band never really achieved the heights of, you know, Maiden or Saxon or Def Leppard or any of those other bands at all. So, but uh, yeah, really great stuff. I recommend it highly. Great choice for today. Okay, okay so album number two is Shock Tactics by Samson. So this was released in May 1981 through RCA. It was produced by Tony Platt, who had worked with the band on a previous album by remixing various things. Well, he remixed a single, but they actually remixed the whole album. That was only released on CD many, many years later. I digress. As I say, this is a third album. The lineup for this album was a singer called Bruce Bruce, that we obviously know better as Bruce Dickinson, Paul Samson on guitar, Chris Aylmer on bass, and uh, Thunderstick on drums. Okay. Barry. Yes, Barry Perkis. But there you go. You look like this. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> is, that the guy from, is that the guy from Pulp Fiction? It looks like it from that <laughs> scene. <laughs> that's him. <laughs> yeah. that, that's there you go. Maybe, so yeah. So maybe. the same lineup had recorded the previous album, which was Head On, which is what I've just uh, shown there. And oddly, they were also credited, and I say pictured, but drawn on the cover of the debut, which is Survivors here, okay? Even though only Paul Samson and Barry Perkis from that four actually play on the album. John McCoy from Gillen and various things, he was actually the bassist on that. He wrote material, all very mixed up at the start, okay? Mm -hmm. um, keeping a steady lineup for, for Samson really was difficult throughout. The, the time as a band. Clive Burr had already joined and left for Iron Maiden by this point, by the summer of 1981, so after this album, um, the Live at Reading album is released with Mel Gaynor, who would go on to be Simple Minds drummer. He's playing drums on that due to musical differences with uh, Thunderstick. And it was at that festival that uh, a certain Rod Smallwood uh, happened to bump into uh, a singer um, and suggest that he may want an audition with the band that he was managing. And from there, this band obviously then changed, and Iron Maiden went on to become the Iron Maiden that we knew from Number of the Beast onwards. Shock Tactics didn't chart anywhere, which is probably no great surprise, really. But when you think about what was happening with the new wave of British heavy metal and the fact that Samson were arguably a little bit ahead of the curve, it's maybe a bit of a surprise, but it's definitely a bit of a shame. So that's Shock Tactics. Bye, Samson. Cool. Simon, your take on the album. Okay. And I'm going to go let the dogs out real quick. I'll carry on. I'll be right back. Just don't talk about me while I'm gone. <laughs> you can trust us. I know I can. I'll be right back. It's okay. It's gone. It's, it's madness. He's left us in control. He has, hasn't he? What can we do? Let's, let's get some new programs. <laughs> Yeah. That Peruvian nose flute one we've always been talking about. Is that it's right? The way, it's the only way forward. Only way. Absolutely. Really is, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Every yes. day without fail. <laughs> Peruvian nose flute yes. at three. All you know it makes sense. Time. We all know it makes sense. Yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah, to move to move to move progress. Um yeah, Samson. Hmm. Like I say, I've got I've got some Samson. I, I, I feel like um, I know why Samson didn't make it. One of the reasons that they didn't make it is by far the best song on this is um, the opening song, uh, Riding with the Angels. And that's a real ballad song, isn't it? it mm -hmm. You know, they, their original materials are fine. Oh, it's it, fine, but just not brilliant and i think actually one thing i was going to mention previously is like sometimes bands like maybe um saxon or diamond head they need a rod smallwood they need a doc mcgee they need a peter, a peter grant they need somebody that may even go and do illegal things on their behalf i'm not that any of those people would <laughs> but you know that that can get them where you know to that to that to the level that they need to be at, you know, you don't want to be on the career record if you're uh, because if you Saxon do, you don't want you want to be on a proper record label. You want you want to have a, a proper fighting chance. You want to have good production. Um, and like I said, 
some I don't like I think the production's not great on this album, which is weird given that didn't Tony Platt do um, All Men Play on Ten and the Man of War? I think he did, yes. Like just one of the loudest records of all time. <laughs> and I, I, and the, t- the 12 inch is just fantastically, stupidly loud. I'm sure it's been mastered in a weird way, but it's a bit, uh, a bit weak. It's a bit, a bit weak. And sometimes, you know, with the um, Diamond Head, I think part of the um, charm of the Diamond Head album is that it's a bit wishy washy production wise. Because this one's just, to me, weak. Needs a bit of oomph, a bit of oomph. You know, I don't know how much oomph there was around back in the early nineteen eighties, but I feel like there are records that have more, more oomph. You know, I do like um, um, Bruce, Bruce singing inverted commas normally. I like that. I've always liked that when he when he when he doesn't seem like he's doing his his best Graham Bonnet impression, singing right at the end of his range all the time. I really, I really genuinely do like that. I think his things riding the angels beautifully. He really does. Um, nice girl. That's a bit odd, isn't it? Slightly suspect, Larry. But it sounds you know, again. Whilst you know, when I, when I reference uh, purple and Sabbath in um, the Diamond Head uh, album, you know, this to me sounds purpley, but isn't a complete rip-off of um, Purple. It's like, oh, yeah, we're a few years on. We've heard, we've heard, we've heard Purple. This is our te- this is our kind of uh, our, te- our take on it. And I, I, it sounds quite gilly on Nice Girl. Um, <laughs> crime, 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 oh, Christ on a bike. Uh, yeah, that's what I mean by the songs were, uh, yeah. yeah. And, but one the the Arguably the most noticeable thing about it is how restrained is Paul Sampson on this? Yes. Yeah, I would agree with that. You know, um, like I said, I've got quite a, quite a, few, quite a bit of Sampson. He's he's really quite quite restrained. Um, you know, this play playing with a song and not not barely appearing on your own your own album, but the band is called Sampson. Is it not? For, for a reason, I thought I thought there might be a bit more uh, guitar pyrotechnics than there are. Possibly, yeah. So, um, it, it it's it's fine. I won't be buying it, but it's it, it, you know I've, I'm I'm glad glad I glad I've heard it. And if if the if the Samsung box set ever comes down in price, I will buy it. There you go. Then you'll get it. Well, we were in complete agreement on Diamond Head, Simon. I would suggest that we're probably not in complete agreement here because I think this is a great album. Um, I think it's easy to hear why Iron Maiden suddenly were propelled into the stratosphere when Dickinson left this band and joined them because he's the difference maker here. This is a strong album with strong songs, um, but... I think he's brilliant here. He's he's got everything. He's howling. His voice is soaring. He brings the air raid siren, but he can also do that kind of storytelling and character driven stuff along the way. And considering that we're so early in his career, I mean, it doesn't sound like that. He's fully formed here. Um, but I really like the songs. Yes, "Riding with the Angels," the Russ Ballard cover that that opens it. I, I really that's a great song. It's a great vocal as well. Um. I think it also kind of unwittingly reveals one of the reasons that the band maybe wouldn't go on to do what they might have done. Because, yeah, the solos from Paul Sampson have a kind of bluesy edge. And as you mentioned, Simon, that kind of nods to maybe purple and various things like that. And when you look at what Paul Sampson did outside of these kind of three albums, I mean, the debut's not even the war by him. It's not really that. It's kind of like a it's a rock record. It's more like Thin Lizzy inspired and, and various things like that. I would suggest head on moves them into new wave of British heavy metal territory. And Shock Tactics for me is kind of the swan song for the band doing that. But he's not necessarily that guitarist. Although you know he's behind these songs, I don't necess- necessarily think he's that guy. Uh, and and that makes it for for an interesting record that I still think really works. I mean. Earth Mother's outstanding. 
I mean, Dickinson takes the the chorus by the scruff of the neck there, and and he's got something special going on. I love Bloodlust. It's a really just a kind of rollicking good time. There's so many vocal tricks in that one. Bright lights. It's energetic. It's bluesy. It's hard hitting. It's got a great chorus and and a vocal that should have, I would say, with the right push, that could have been a hit. Back in this era, when bands of this kind of ilk could actually get hits, and the rest of the album is really solid. I don't think necessarily that the rest of the album is outstanding, but there's some really good stuff here, and the rhythm section is good. Go to hell, I like the rhythm section of what they're doing in, in that, but I think it's a good album from start to finish, and I really, although I wouldn't change Iron Maiden's history in any, any way, I would love to have heard what one more album with this lineup would actually have been able to do for Samson, because it, it's all here. It's ready to go. They just ne- kind of need a little bit more oomph, I think, it's, in the same way that Simon had mentioned. It just needs a little bit more push behind it. And they did make some really, really good albums after this, but they become a kind of hard rock band. And Paul Samson kind of reminds me, in a way, of, I don't know, Ronnie Montrose, just when it was nearly there, just when you thought he's cracked it, this is going to happen this time, he would be in a different direction. The band would fall apart, you know, and it just it almost seemed like as everybody else was kind of going, right, this is the way to go and we know what's going to happen. I mean, even before the storm and Don't Get Mad, Get Even, which follow these albums, they're hard rock albums. They're really good. And they do two albums like that and then they go do something else again. So every time the fans could kind of say, oh, well, okay, actually, I get it now, I'm on board. He went, no, I, I'm, I'm bored now. I want to go and do something else. But I think this is as good as they got, really. I do like, I must admit, the, the albums that follow this, the hard rock albums, because that's where my heart was at. But Shock Tactics is, is excellent, in my humble opinion. I think I'm like somewhere in between the both of you on this one. Um, I think Bruce is outstanding here across the whole album. And like you said, Stephen, I think he does a little bit of everything or a lot of bit of everything that we really like so much from him. He's doing the heavy metal shrieking. He's doing a little more mellower stuff. He even does pretty well on some of these bluesy or boogie tracks, I think. He's great. And it's no surprise that, you know, when both Samson and Iron Maiden were recording an album in the same studio right next to each other and Deano was already, you know, the band was probably like, yeah, you know, if that doesn't work out, that's the guy across the hall. We want him. It's not surprising that that's what happened here. Uh, I think half of this album, for me, I like a lot. The other half, I'm I'm kind of like, eh, on. Uh, as Simon always likes to point out. <laughs> I saw that yeah. sticker there. Eh. Um, yeah. I think Riding with the Angels, which, again, is a Russ Ballad song, I think that's terrific. I mean, they turn it into just a killer metal song. It's just, it's got some really good guitar work from from Mr. Sampson, and I think uh, Bruce sounds great. Enough. I love Earth Mother. That's nice and heavy. Bruce is screaming up a storm on that. Um, I don't really care for Nice Girl all that much. It's kind of groovy. It's okay. Bloodlust is kind of bluesy, and that doesn't do much for me either. Go to Hell, to me, should be this big heavy metal rocker. To me, it sounds kind of pedestrian, but I love Bright Lights. I think that's catchy. Got some nice riffs in that. Really good song. Once Bitten. It's fun, kind of mid-paced, heavy metal thumper. I like that. Grime Crime, when they do this kind of like metallic boogie stuff, I'm kind of checking out. But uh, I love Communion. It's this nice slow builder of a dramatic track. It's heavy, it's mellow, it's atmospheric, and Bruce does all these different kind of voices in it. I love it. Um, so for me, I'm kind of like, I think this is a is a really good record. I don't think it's quite a classic but I think that without Bruce, this is a pretty average record. I think he's the one who helps it dial it up to a certain level that so many people love this record. I think it's more because of him. I agree with Simon. I think I would like to hear more all guitar work on here for sure. Uh, there's, there's guitars on here, but I I, I want that. I want him to unleash a little bit more. To me, it's almost like it's a vehicle for Bruce and and on that aspect it succeeds. So um, so I don't know. Half of it I really like a lot. The other half is kind of average to me. Uh, but I think in their catalog it sits at, you know near the top because of uh because of Bruce. 
mainly, and some really good songs. But yeah, I recommend it for sure. I like it. Um, I don't know if it's classic quite, but it's pretty close, I think. Okay, All right. so that takes us to the third selection, which is Night of the Demon by Demon, which was released also in 1981. Um, the band were actually signed to Clear Records, which was Mike Stone's record label, but they were then licensed out to Career, who had a French label, I believe, who also had Saxon on them. Um, Stone is credited as an executive producer, um, but the record was actually produced by the band themselves, which is a little unusual for a band recording their debut with no real kind of track record behind them. So the band was formed by Dave Hill on vocals and Miles Spooner on guitar. They were joined by Les Hunt on guitar, Chris Ellis on bass, and John Wright on drums. They'd all been in a band called Hunter prior to joining up. Now, I don't think the album charted anywhere, as far as I can see, um, but coming from the kind of the same label that Saxon were on, clearly marked this band out as a new wave of British heavy metal band. And it's definitely something that the cover reaffirms here, I would suggest, as does the album title. This kind of screams heavy metal in a way that an awful lot of things didn't back then. Um, Demon would release albums regularly until 1992 without ever really breaking through beyond kind of being a cult act uh, and then they split up for a time they reformed in 2001 and they've released albums on a semi-regular basis since with a new one Invincible due just next month that was only just announced a couple of days ago the only original member left now is the singer Dave Hill uh, and that is Night of the Demon by Demon all right, Simon, what do you think? This, my friends, is the dog's bollocks. Simon Bray, oh, heart, oh heartedly approves of um, Night of the Demon. So, <laughs> so much so that he brought he bought the um, the picture disc version. Yes, yes, he did. Oh, yes, I like I like I like this a lot. I actually would suggest that it is a new wave of British heavy metal album because why not? You know, it wasn't it. Wasn't it? I like that produced? reasoning. I like that reasoning. Why the fuck not? Well, you know, if you, if, if you know, if, here's a time to have that discussion. You know, if 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 you think that, um, to me, de demon are kind of like UFO -y, thin lizzy, -y, -y, white snakey at times. You know, why not? You know, other bands that get lumped in as you know, new album bands, Spider Status Quo. You know, this. This, it's it's a broad church like the like the genre of metal itself is you know do they sound like Venom no no they don't they sound like Motorhead no they don't they're not like Def Leppard they're not like Saxon they're not like Iron Maiden it's a very very broad church do they have do they have guitars yes yes they do the um, is the production a little bit homemade yeah yes it is but that's part of it I've killed him <laughs> you just fell off his seat there you said homemade boom oh, gone. He's gone to find his Peruvian nose flute. Oh, he has indeed, yes. I think he but, sat on yeah. it. Back, I think. Oh, wow. Okay. So, um, yes, um, I, I, I really, really like this record. I um, I may, may have invested in more more demonic material as well. Um, but, yeah, um, some really, really good stuff on it. And, but the, the opening track, you know, um, you think, oh, this is going to be really scary shit, like listening to Black Sabbath, like when I'm walking through somewhere really frightening. Oh, 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 Night of the Demon, it's not like that. It's Oh, that's took a turn, hasn't it? You know what I mean? Um, but side, side one is magnificent, utterly magnificent. Um, you know, if we, were, if we were going through perfect sides again, I'd, I'd be going, oh, look at this, this is a good one. Side two's not quite as good, but there's some really good shit here. Um <clears throat> So, um, um, Decisions is UFO. Uh, I think throughout he, he, he's delivery because he, they're from the Midlands, aren't they? I think. I think so. Um, throughout he, his phrase, his style of phrasing reminds me of um, of Phil Mogg. It might not remind anybody else of him, but it reminds me of me of him, and that's always a good thing. Yeah, you're pulling your face, Stephen. Don't do that. Um, no, that was me being thoughtful, Simon. I was actually being thoughtful. You've never seen that before. That's no, what I, from. I, didn't, I didn't even know you could do that. <laughs> Holy shit. Wow. Yeah. Anyhow, um, I, I, feel, I feel a lot of 
uh, UFOs. I listen to this record. I even think that that one might actually, with with bigger keys, might have ended up on, or it could have ended up on misdemeanor. Um, this I love um, fool to play, fool to um, play the hard way. I mean that, that could have been a hit. That really that really could have been been a hit. Maybe stateside. It sounds a bit. Um, um, oh, what's the song it reminds me? You know, when you have those moments because you've got the olds and you're thinking, oh, fool around and fell in love. It's got that kind of vibe, that kind of vibe, that kind of vibe to it. Um, AC, um, ACDC slash White Snake got together and made um, Big Love. Yeah, how how can you have a how how unless you're Fleetwood Mac, can you uh, have a have a song called Big Love and not not make it sound ridiculously brilliant? Eh? <laughs> It really, really is, and don't they foreshadow where they're going with into the into the uh, into the nightmare? Um, nightmare, yes, uh, yeah, into the nightmare. Don't know why I confused myself there. They for, kind of foreshadow because they did. Like many, many of these bands, they kind of start out no woman and then then they get their well, this is what we really want to do. You know, I may end up as a meandering prog band. That sort of thing, uh, sax, sax and cover um, ride like the wind. Yeah, <laughs> then suddenly remember that they're a great metal band. Uh, you know, they kind of, they kind of go in different places. If you know the ones that have got some form of longevity, and you, you can see what you can see with uh, Into the Nightmare. Oh, that's where we might be going. You know, we might be going a little bit more. They made a melodic rock album. That damn that that way. Um, a very very much in enjoy uh, this record very very much so and i am i am prepared to stick my color to the mask my, and say yes it is a album album yes it is you know okay. your, your comment about ufo's misdemeanor i think is very well founded because starting with their next record it's not all that different right <clears throat> i'll leave it at that i'm gonna pick up from where simon left off and that is he's gonna See, this is a new wave of British heavy metal album. And yes, it is, because I really think that what we do now is that we look at things through a completely different spectrum. We go back and look, I don't just mean we, the three of us, I mean in general, we look at albums that came out 40 years ago plus, and we categorise them by what we now describe all of these musical genres by. Heavy metal was a thing back then, it was a movement, and it was really broad, and it didn't need to sound like that. You didn't need to have like, guitars that sound like this, and a vocalist that does that, and if he grills too much, it's death. And if he doesn't do that enough, then it's symphonic. And all the bollocks that we end up doing now, because that's what it is, it's all bollocks. It's all just made up, and it's just so that people... Because you could say it. every band that we now label as New Wave of British Heavy Metal, if we look at their output from back in 1980, 81, 82, absolutely none of them sound alike. No, they don't. It's... What it is, is a movement. It's a movement, that's all it is. It's a movement, that's what it is. It is bands who are playing heavy rock. Because nothing, I would go as far as to suggest that by modern standards, maybe with a few exceptions, Venom possibly, none of that is heavy metal by what we call it now. Not even arguably the first couple Iron Maiden albums. Arguably. Because metal has moved into something else entirely now. So when we come to look at bands like this... Maybe Angel Witch. Yeah, as I said, there, there are a few exceptions yeah. there, yes, uh, but, uh, but they are few and far between, really. You look at Saxon, arguably the archetypal new wave of British heavy metal band, and you look at Wheels of Steel and Straw on the Lawn, now you go, they're great heavy rock albums, aren't they? That's kind of where we've moved to. This is a heavy rock band that happened to come out during a period when all of these bands, because they were heavy, were called metal in some shape or form. And it was the new wave of British heavy metal because the scene had come from here before with Sabbath and Priest and all of those kind of bands and all we're doing is we're saying look it's bands like this are coming back again is really all we're going to do and yet this is a confused album because what you do have side one arguably is a new wave of British heavy metal side it's what it is yeah it's got full moon it's got Spooky keyboards that Aussie would nick later on, fun enough, chanting and kind of crazed laughs. There's some sort of fun enough, demonic invocation going on. You know, we are, we are going to pull a demon out of the ground and we're going to absolutely adore it as we do. And then we go into Night of the Demon, which is just a great hard rock song, is what it is. But side one is a cult lyric based, it has a theme, 
this is I believe in the original press thing. The lyrics on the back is you can't see at all because it's so I can't I can barely read them. There's lyrics on both sides of this. So the lyrics for side one. They don't even own up to the lyrics on side two because the album becomes something different. How are you gonna read side. any of that? Even on the CD, it's ridiculous. Well, there you go. I, I mean, but they don't even put side two's lyrics on it anywhere, Pete. It's just a strange kind of thing. But it's almost like they've kind of gone, side one was what we intended to do here. They made us record the rest. That's not to say that it's not brilliant, but it doesn't necessarily all feel like a cohesive album. Dave Hill is a great rock singer, and he is a great rock singer. He's not a metal singer. But man, oh man, what a great singer he was. And still is, I may add. I mean, everyone's aged, myself included, but even on the new song, he still sounds great. Um, there's, there's twin guitar stuff here. In places, they almost sound like Wishbone Ash merged with a bit of Magnum, with a bit of Rainbow pushed in there. There's a whole load of stuff going on. It is heavy. It is melodic. It's not what we would call metal, really, in any shape or form. Now, back then, arguably, yes, because to your commoner, Penwin, it wasn't really into the scene, but I had a bit of a crunchy guitar. Oh, it's that heavy metal thing. So they were heavy metal bands back then, do you know? In the Nightmare... That is a great song. Snarling vocals, great guitar lines from Spooner and Hunt. The big chant along chorus, Father of Time. I just will absolutely love that. It's the classiest thing on the whole album. And it is a precursor to kind of the melodic, throbbing, almost modern doom scene that is out there. You can kind of see that transposing what a lot of bands are doing now. Then Decisions has got kind of howling guitars, power along, a great riff with a better production, same again, this could have gone out somewhere. And then, as we move into side two, I mean, Liar, which is, I just absolutely love that song, but it lands somewhere between Thin Lizzy and Ellie Whitesnake. I mean, that that is prime time for me. That's I'm on board. I, there's no complaints there. But it doesn't necessarily connect with what's been on side one. It's an odd, kind of confused album that just works. And it works for all the right reasons, because the songwriting is really good. The band believe in it. That's what comes across to me when I listen to this, is the band absolutely believe in it. Simon really landed on something earlier on, because the album that would follow, so that's the unexpected guest would come next. That kind of moves things along. It's connected to Night of the Demon. But then by the time we get to The Plague, album number three, I mean, we're almost verging into frog rock here. That's what we're doing. So, you know, it, it's a concept album, it's much more thoughtful, much more constructed. And then we move into uh, British Standard Approved, which I don't have to hand. I mean, that really could have been something that Roger Waters put together. Within four albums, we've moved from one place to somewhere else entirely. So the question that kind of came up when this category was thought of was, is this Nawabaham? Is it new wave of British heavy metal? And the answer is absolutely yes, of course it is because it was released at the time when all of these bands and albums were. Through a modern spectrum, absolutely not. Not even close. It's a rock album, but it's a great rock album. And it's Demon are one of those bands that just, with a blip here and there, to be fair, just deserve much more recognition for just putting out consistently excellent albums. So yeah, I really like this. Yeah, I do as well. Uh, I'm going to tell a little story here, I, and, and I've heard it from multiple people, but one always sticks in my mind. So Steve Levin, who um frequent uh, guest on uh, Steve Keeler's Rock Fantasy Files show, and I know Steve a long time. Uh, I remember once, years and years ago, I was talking to Steve Levin, and we were talking about New Wave of British Heavy Metal albums, and he goes, he goes, and I remember he went and grabbed the copy, he goes, you remember this album? He goes, I remember seeing this in the record store in 1981 when it first came out. I was like, holy cow, look at that. That looks metal as fuck. I'm going to buy this. And I went home and I put it on. I'm like, this isn't heavy metal. What is this wimpy shit? He goes, they totally sold it with that, but then there, it didn't live up to the billing. And I always remember that. And he tells that story every now and then. And I'm kind of like, and yeah, uh, this screams the heaviest thing ever. This looks evil. Uh it's a great album cover. The back is awesome. But you know what? It doesn't have to be as heavy as it depicts because I think it works. Um, to me, you know, like the song Night of the Demon is a great track. It's catchy, but it has more in common with like 
the first two Magnum albums than it does with Iron Maiden or Saxon or any other band from this era. Um, the riffing is good. The vocals are catchy. I love Nightmare. Father of Time is just soaring melodic rock. That's what it is. Um, Decisions, to me, you listen to a song like Decisions and you listen to his vocals, really good singer, reminds me, it could have been a Y&T song. That's kind of what some of this stuff is. Because y and is another band. Right? I don't want to get off track, but y and is another band. It's like, well, what do you call them? They're not this, they're not that. They're, they're just y and right? This band is very, very similar. Uh, you mentioned Liar, Stephen. I think that's a terrific anthem. Yeah. And that reminds me of where Uriah Heep were going to go like within a year for the Abominog album. Very yeah. similar type thing. Fool to play the hard way. Reminds me of White Snake. Um, Ride the Wind is Catchy. One Hell of a Night is really good. I think this is a terrific little album. Um, again, perhaps not metal in the grand scheme of things of what we know as heavy metal, but for the time, this was heavy enough, right? And it's part of this whole movement. Uh, they would get real keyboardy and kind of proggy going forward. And, uh, and a lot of that stuff is really good too. But this, I think, is just filled with great songs, great playing, great vocals. And it's a fun album to listen to. And it's wrapped in all this, like, you know, some of the lyrical content of a few of the songs are trying to make it into this thing that it really wasn't. And I think that probably pissed off some people. But, and, you know, and again, does does the name of the band and the cover and the title of the songs, did that scare away people who otherwise this might have appealed to? Because I think this album has a lot of broad appeal that it probably didn't get for obvious reasons, like we just mentioned. I think it's a classic and I, is it new wave of British heavy metal? It's not really heavy metal, but it belongs here as do other bands from this time period, from this movement that kind of did similar type stuff, but they were lumped in with everything else. But yeah, I think, I think it's a great album and it, you know, it's a good catalog as well. I'm really looking forward to hearing the new one, which is called invincible, which is coming out real soon. Like Stephen mentioned. So, yeah. So the question that we always ask when we do the Melodic Rock show, but we'll ask here as well then. So, Simon, if you could keep only one of these three, which would it be? It's probably going to be the only one that I actually own, isn't it? <laughs> it's, going to, it's going to be Demon, isn't it? It's so sexy. It's just... that, is, that, that, is, that is a sexy thing. I mean, I, I'm talking about the record, Simon. Pete? Well... I'm gonna take. I'm gonna keep the diamond head, but I'm gonna cheat and I'm gonna somehow hide the demon in Tala's sweater. She's not wearing a sweater. But make sure she wears a sweater so that when she comes with me, I'll be like, "Ha ha! I got two here out of this pile." No disrespect to the Samson because I like that too, but I, I, th I feel much, much stronger about these other two. But yeah, the, the diamond head. With all kidding aside, uh, gotta have this one. I just I, that's an absolute classic of the genre here. So gotta have it. For, for me, we started with a really strong three. I, I found this really difficult even contemplate getting rid of any of the three. For importance, I would find it really difficult to get rid of the Diamond Head because without it, music is totally different, I think, really, uh, and not for the better. But if you ask me which one I'm going to play again tomorrow, I'm going to play this because I just, I just love it so much. And I must admit that since I've kind of turned my attention to putting everything together for the show... I just started at the start of the Demon catalogue and worked my way through and listened to the whole thing because I just couldn't not. It would be a, I don't know who's got what. It would be a fascinating catalogue to rank because there's so much variation in there, so many different yeah. lineups and various things. What a band. As I say, really deserve much more credit. That would be what I would keep. Yeah, they have third uh, before the new album. That's that will be number fourteen. They have thirteen albums in their catalogue. I think I maybe have half of them, uh, and I haven't heard the others. So I. I I would like to probably investigate the ones that I don't have and I and do a ranking at some point down the road a ways. But yeah, it's the our ups and downs people in general, the standards really, really good, really high, right across the board. Yeah. You heard it first, UK connection. Uh, renewed until twenty twenty eight. Yes, that contract is signed, sealed, and delivered. Yes. <laughs> you know, I'm not even management. <laughs> Making all the decisions that count, though, Simon. <laughs> so for everybody watching, uh, let us know if you enjoyed this, because we have talked about doing more New Wave of British heavy metal themed stuff. And I think this, this was fun to do. And uh, I think 
you know, there's so many bands and albums that we could choose for these. I think the hardest will be the kind of like, was it a new wave of British heavy metal thing? But I think there's there's enough out there that we could probably slot anything in and we could just do a three square regardless. Um, but what's cool is there's so many albums and I'm sure there's albums that are notable that maybe some of us haven't even heard. And I think, you know, we love yeah, listening to new stuff just as much as anybody else. So that's not really an issue. So if you want to see more new wave of British heavy metal themed episodes like this, let us know down there below Simon and uh we will be reading those so steve but in the meantime steven you want to give everybody a taste of what's happening next episode yes well we were in general very positive about everything in, in this show so in two weeks time we may be slightly less positive about everything because we are going to talk about classic bands that we can't stand now i don't know if we're doing five or three each i don't think we can probably do any more than five not because we couldn't choose them but because the we'll show be here all day. Be, yeah we'd be here <laughs> all day so yes we are i'm sure going to piss some people off because yeah we're going to shit on things you love not because we just want to shit on things you love but because we generally don't like them we don't like so them they, yeah so you think can't about that for like me. every band folks so don't take it personally yeah. right or, or take it personally if you want i don't care yeah. <laughs> and here's what we should do we haven't we haven't talked about this but i'm just going to throw it out there since we're going to be talking about bands we generally don't like we should start off the episode drinking a beer that we really, really love. All right. Are we down with that, Simon? Yeah, actually, actually love. Yes. You're not, yes. You're not big. Okay, so, not so I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have to drink Foster's or shit like that. No, no a beer that you really, really, really like a lot. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. And Fair not enough. Not one that you pre-loved, Simon. No, oh, thank you. Can I can I also make a suggestion? Yes. Which yes. you may not like. I think we should have to prove that we've made the effort with these bands. So, for instance, right? Um, I'm not going to use these examples. I can't stand Blur, right? But I have never invested in any Blur because I don't think I like them and I can't stand his voice, right? But I do own some Oasis albums and I do actually like one of them but the rest are absolute bollocks. So I, I can prove, I can physically show and tell that I have made the effort with all the bands that I, slash artists I'm going to slaughter. Starting with Rush, that's not true. I just wanted to see your face. So I will, I'm probably going to pick bands that I probably have owned stuff in the past, but I've gotten rid of them, gotten rid of them because yeah. I don't like them at all. So I, I must admit that to disappoint people, even though I've got all this pile of stuff behind me, I have in recent years started to part with things that I really don't like. There's not much. I haven't done it with the vinyl, to be fair, so I could maybe have to think about it through the vinyl. But with CDs, if I don't I like it... I have never got rid of anything. No, it's been... A, if I if I hadn't done that in recent years, I, I would be recording this in the garden somewhere. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, been the same more than anything else. But yeah, I'll, tr I'll try to stick to that as best I can, but I can't promise. That's okay. Try, Stephen, yeah. try. I know where you live. Do our best. Otherwise, I'm going to load up my Prezi and there'll be images that I can show. Oh, God. We'll have that at least. Oh, but of course, then, 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 the, then the, the people in the, I'll be like, I hate when they don't show physical product. Why, why can you? Because I get that all the time. It's like when we use the Prezi, they're like, why are they not showing the actual LP or, or CD? It's like, that's not fair. It's like, well, it's not, you want to buy it for me just so I can show it and then throw it in the garbage? I can do that too. You know, it's like, Jesus. <laughs> anyway oh dear yes we digress as always <laughs> that's what's coming up in two weeks so uh be prepared and uh in the meantime let us know what you think of these three albums down in the comments below and which you would take with you if you can only pick one no wrong answer here and uh this is on the web at www.seatranquility.org we're on facebook we're on youtube all together all the damn time please subscribe if you haven't already and click on that notification bell and you get so you get alert of all of our content as a post and please do hit the like button before you leave uh happy happy saturday everybody i just realized i didn't finish my beer i guess because i've been running downstairs too often to go take my dogs out and bring them in but uh i will rectify that hold on ah yes till next time for simon brain stephen reed imp pardo thanks for watching us here on the uk connection as always Tune in tomorrow morning for ranking the albums. 
Rick Levante. <laughs> regretting that now, Pete. Regretting that now. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've spoken over the top of whatever you're ranking. I have no idea what you're ranking, but you, you're regretting that now. <laughs> ranking the albums, top 10 anyway, of Savoy Brown, myself, and Rick Labonte. That's coming up tomorrow. So stay tuned for that. Also, hopefully, if it all goes according to plan, Rick Rick uh, Catino. I was going to say Rick Patino, not that Rick Patino. Rick Catino, and I will be will be bringing you the second episode in our look at the great new wave of traditional heavy metal bands. So, episode number two coming up as well. So, lots happening this weekend. Till then, enjoy everybody. See you in two weeks back here on the UK Connection. Take care. Bye bye.